Michelle Marie McGrath. Welcome to a very special episode today of Unclassified Woman and I'm excited to share a couple of firsts today in that it's the first time I've had a couple of people on at the same time and it's also the first time there has been a man on the show. I know, I know. Um, It's not something that I'd anticipated given the subject matter and the topics that we discuss. However, I hope you'll agree it's absolutely fitting and appropriate that he is on, given the nature of his very special work. And so today I'm speaking to Dr. Azra Bertrand, MD, and Seren Bertrand, who are founders of the Fountain of Life Grail Mystery School. They are teachers and mentors of mine, and have so much wisdom to share. They are authors of the groundbreaking new book, Womb Awakening, Initiatory Wisdom from the Creatrix of All Life. This has been described by New York Times bestselling authors as a masterwork of beauty, power and mystical truth, a magical sacred feminine transmission and a mystery school in a book. Azra Bertrand graduated from the prestigious Duke University School of Medicine and has been a pioneering doctor, alchemical scientist and spiritual guide for 20 years. Seren Bertrand is a womb intuitive and channel of the sacred feminine mysteries and has been immersed in womb awakening practices for more than a decade. Together they are evolutionary enchanters dedicated to help women awaken their womb power and assist the rebirth of the masculine into his true gifts, uniting them both in sacred union. As midwives of the return of womb consciousness, they draw rich veins of wisdom from many traditions and have assisted over 25,000 people to heal on a physical, emotional, spiritual level over 20 years. And... After having worked with them both, personally and in group consciousness, I can really agree with those descriptions. They are both amazing teachers and mentors. And you know those conversations that you have with people where you just have light bulbs going off all the time? Well, that's exactly what they're both like. With so much talk these days about the return of the divine feminine and rising feminine consciousness, there can also be a lot of superficiality and not really a deep understanding of what this actually entails. I feel they are really embodying this consciousness and way show us for the rest of us, reminding us to dive deeply into the wisdom of our own bodies and souls. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. So welcome Azra and Seren. So happy to have you here today and really excited to hear all about your work and your fabulous book. It's great to be here, Michelle. We're really happy to be speaking to you and to be sharing the news about um, our forthcoming book, Womb Awakening. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. No, it's going to be great. And I was almost thinking it's such a huge topic. It's almost hard to know where to start because I know that we could probably talk all week, really. Very much so. (laughs) And so just to give us a little bit of background and context, are you able to share a little bit about your background and how you came to be doing what you are now? Because I'm sure it's quite a story. Yes, it's it's a big story and it's a personal story and also an archetypal story. So it's a story that speaks to all of us and the times we're living in. And, and just before we um, kind of go, get to the background, uh, I'd love to just uh, put in a little bit of perspective about the release of the book, uh, which is on August 22nd, which is a solar eclipse. And it's connected with the symbol uh, of rebirthing the mermaids. Oh, brilliant. So uh, 
you know, this is a really deep subject because in the book we talk about how the mermaids are actually the priestesses who held the wisdom of the ancient feminine traditions. So there's this incredible node of synchronicity that our book has been birthed into the world on this very particular solar eclipse. And solar eclipses in you know the history of the world uh, have always been considered a, a unique time of massive paradigm shifts and rebirth and so on the waves of that our, our book womb awakening is released reclaiming the wisdom of the feminine mysteries and the mermaids and so that kind of uh, ties back to 2012 mm. which is when we created a uh, fountain of life together through this amazing time of a rebirth of the feminine mysteries and and this time frame between 2012 and this solar eclipse is very connected and you know many people listening to this call might feel that in their own lives and journey when they cast their mind back to what was happening for them in 2012. So for Azra and I, what was happening in 2012 uh, was that we had this incredible experience of union. And through that vibration, the blueprint of our teachings uh, came through. And the the work that we share in the book actually all came through uh, in 2012, this mystical birthing gate of consciousness that, you know, the Mayans have spoken of. Yeah. And it was really rooted in uh, Azra and I coming together. So this is very much a vision that's not my vision or Azra's vision. It's a vision that came through our, our union. So it's very unique. It's it's this sacred union uh, vision of the feminine mysteries uh, that includes the masculine that doesn't uh, kind of leave him loitering outside the red tent, yeah. <laughs> as, as you may say. And and so, you know, it was an incredible experience. And we go into to more details of uh, this experience in the book but out of that we we got married in 2012 and and actually in Iona on our honeymoon we uh decided to hold you know we decided to bring forth the work into the world and and set in motion uh for our first retreat which was in Cornwall so so 2012 really was this huge uh shift in consciousness for us that where we received this this blueprint and so um and of course the the preparation for receiving this information or wisdom or visionary transmission had been a, a long, long time in the making through both our, our personal journeys. And for me, it, it was that the womb and menstruation were always the siren call that brought me back to my body and yeah. brought me back to earth and brought me back to this world. And like many women and men, I was fascinated with uh, transcendental experiences, you know, ecstatic experiences out of the body uh, yeah. because this is what the culture reflected to me. Uh, that being in a woman's body with, you know, wombs and menstruation was really the lowest of the low, that, that are kind of an unclean, taboo, shameful thing. So so as a young girl, I, I was fascinated by astral travel, psychic phenomena, you know, supernatural experience. Yeah. <laughs> and I was seeking for it outside my body. Yeah. And and then the womb kept calling me back home. And 
I I did a long battle with that call. <laughs> I, I didn't surrender straight away. So the first moment I heard that call was as a teenage girl uh, around the time of my menarche, my first menstruation and coming of age. And again, there, were, there was no guidance in the world as to how this may be a sacred initiation into my femininity and womanhood. Yeah, it's just not something that we're taught, is it? I mean, imagine how different the world would be is as little girls, we were taught that this was a really sacred, powerful experience, this initiation into, you know, the different stages of becoming a woman. I mean, the world would be a very different place, wouldn't it? the world would be beyond recognition and of course as I often describe it as a woman with a womb the most powerful portal of creation coming into that creative power it's it's like you're given the keys to a Porsche but no one's taught you how to drive and of course it would be a different place for men as well and this is one of the the visions for for our work in this book the womb awakening book is that there is a return of the sacred feminine and everything that that means for women and men. So this is the world of feelings, the world of embodiment, the world of intuitions and dreams and a world that is interconnected with Gaia, with nature and the earth and a world that honors sexuality and doesn't shame it and and a world that honors motherhood, of course, because it's, it's mothers who who really create the next generation and create the, the emotional safety and the psychic foundation. And, and I'll just speak a little bit about my background as well. So I'm a medical doctor and, and have uh, done a lot of research, including research into the field of attachment and mother-baby bonding and, and really primal love. We'll call it primal love. Yeah. And have been a healer for almost 20 years now and worked with maybe 25,000 people. And again, you know, that was the <laughs> that was the setup. That was the that was the um, foundation, but really the work that we share with the Fountain of Life and the vision that came through this book, like Saren mentioned, really was born through our relationship and opening into love and everything that meant. And really, it was just such an exciting time for us. It was like the doors of of the cosmic womb, the great womb, that opened and just downloaded these incredible experiences, these altered states of consciousness that we were in for months at a time and information. And and so really, that's that's the context in the background. It's a a space in a field that's inclusive of women, of men, of children and families, of uh, interwoven with the earth. And it's really uh, a blueprint of where we're heading as a society in the future. And it really is about divine union, isn't it? And bringing together the masculine and feminine imbalance. Because we hear a lot about this, like the resurgence and the return of the divine feminine. But it's not meant to be at the detriment of the masculine, is it? And I think there's sometimes a bit of confusion around that. Like, let's get rid of this patriarchal model. And it can often be, you know, misunderstood. Absolutely, Michelle. And I feel what happened for me in 2012, it was almost as if I received the initiation I should have received age 13. Yes, And all this time, all this journeying, all this, you know, seeking. And then finally in 2012, I I received this initiation directly from the Earth Mother and the cosmic womb. And and really, it, it, it overwrote all the programming I'd had. So, you know, winding back to, again, menarche uh, and this time in my life when I was coming into my power A, nobody told me that there was an immense feminine creative power in my body. No one taught me about the sacred potential of menstruation. No one taught me that not only could I mother physical babies, but I could be a mother to spiritual 
creations and that motherhood had a a vast umbrella to it of of what a woman and her womb can mother and i was not taught about love or men or what could happen in union with a man so like most women I was stumbling in the dark. It was like my sexuality was forbidden and shamed or or kind of misused or catcalled. Uh, I was totally separated from men. I had no one understanding what they were going through. And then on top of that, I was receiving a lot of um, feminist information, yeah. which at the time was really necessary and really lit me up and enabled me to choose a different path to uh, my mother and her generation who had not had the opportunities I had. Yeah. And, and so, but again, feminism was something that like this search for a transcendental spirituality or, you know, uh, emancipation, that everything kept leading me away from yes. my own body and from my own femininity. One day when I was around 13, I was walking through the town where I lived and I was from a very non-religious background and there was a, a, a cathedral, a church, and I felt compelled to go inside. And all the stained glass windows are uh, all feminine saints and icons such as Mary Magdalene, uh, Saint Hilda of, um, of Whitby. And, and in the bookstore, there was this small white book about a saint that I'd never heard of called Mary Magdalene. I just knew I had to have this book. So I took the book and as I uh, went to read it, it cut my finger Ugh. and the red blood infused onto the, the white parchment paper. And it, it, it kind of catalyzed a visionary experience with Mary Magdalene, which demonstrated to me that uh, healing our feminine wounds so we can embody our true feminine divinity was going to be the way that the entire world was resurrected. Mm. And it's really great that you mention Mary Magdalene because she's very much linked with the womb mysteries, isn't she? And after being obviously maligned for centuries by the Catholic Church, was granted her own feast day, like I think it's within the last year or so, isn't it? So can you talk a bit about the link between her and, you know, how she's one of those goddesses that seems to be very much a guardian of the womb mysteries? Mary, Mary Magdalene is such an important figure in, in this lineage because there's one of the things is that there is an actual spiritual lineage of actual individuals who have been opening these doorways of consciousness for a long time now. And and Mary Magdalene is is a key. She's a key. And one of the things people don't realize about Mary Magdalene, which begins to give you a sense of her history and background, is the actual meaning and origin of her name. Mm. And so Mary, or, or Mariam, as it would have been in Hebrew or Aramaic, is a priestess name. It comes from the tradition of the temples of Isis. And Mary meant beloved. It also meant uh, of the sea, like the, the great maternal sea mother. And it was a title that was given to Isis. So in, in ancient times in Egypt, Isis was called Mary Isis or Isis Mary. And all of the priestesses of Isis had the titular name, the titular name of Mary. And so this is the first key in understanding who Mary Magdalene is. And, and the name Magdalene is also a, a titular name. It's a, it's a title with meaning. Magdalene in the ancient Semitic languages, mag meant great or magical. And dal or daleth meant doorway or portal. So the name Magdalene or Magdala meant magical portal or magical doorway. It's just gorgeous. Isn't it? Isn't it? Mm. And the and this doorway, everyone knew in those days it referred to the portal of the womb. And the womb is 
how we are birthed into the womb, how we are birthed into the world, and how creations and new consciousness are birthed into the world. And, and so this was Mary Magdalene's name. So, of course, Mary Magdalene is, you know, one of the guardians of the grail. And also, when I say Mary Magdalene, I also include um, feminine divinities from other traditions and lineages. So, such as Yeshe Sogyal in the Tibetan tradition, or white buffalo calf woman in the Native American traditions. So, all of these women, these female divinities are presiding like a council over the womb mysteries. And the energy essence is what we associate with Mary Magdalene, which is present in actually every tradition, has this essence of this uh, divinized womb priestess who, who took the journey and awakened her womb and really embodied the, the blueprint of true femininity. So, And as, as you mentioned, Michelle, the Catholic Church has well, for a while recognized the feast day of Mary Magdalene of July 22nd, yeah. and then recently publicly declared and recognized that Mary Magdalene was the apostle of the apostles. And and it was really, you know, it's in my mind, it's like there is so much energy around Mary Magdalene. Yeah. The Catholic Church couldn't ignore her any longer and and really had to say, well, okay, she really was somebody. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. They weren't ready to go so far as to say she was the wife and beloved of Jesus, which we yeah. feel very strongly. But they at least said, well, she's the apostle of the apostles. She is the, she's the leader of the apostles in, in this sense. And it's just amazing. I've always found it fascinating that, you know, they've always referred to her as a prostitute and, you know, very negative connotations towards her. And yet what I found really interesting was when we look at some of the original meanings of these words, um, womb and harlot, some of the interpretations of that and the historical um, background is just Amazing. We can see how it's been really distorted. So are you able to share what some of those meanings are? Because I know that you've done a lot of research about it. Yeah. So it, after I just, you know, kind of add this detail in, Azra will go through more of the word meanings. But this um, concept of the holy whore oh. and the divine harlot is really at the heart and root of these traditions. And um, and so going back to this experience I had with Mary Magdalene as a young teenager, afterwards I began to paint uh, wombs of light and trees, magical trees that had wombs in them, either that were glowing red light or wombs with like magical fetuses in them. And obviously at the time I had no idea what that meant. I, it was just pouring from my unconscious, from my womb consciousness after this experience with Mary Magdalene as if she was symbolically transmitting these um, images through me. And only, you know, much later did, did I discover that um, magical trees with wombs or fetuses are the symbol of a womb shaman. Wow. And that wombs of light are are the is the meaning of the word harlot wow awesome poor. so it's uh, so it was like a precursor it was even though consciously i had no idea what those images meant um, and I often painted eyes in the womb as well. And eyes are symbolic of the cervical gateway, the cervical eye between the worlds. So, so these symbols are very ancient and they poured out from my unconscious. And then only much later on, and especially with the research we did with the book, I understood how connected they are to the womb mysteries and how Mary Magdalene was transmitting these archetypal symbols 
to me so that even I couldn't understand what they meant on a on a body level I was working with these symbols as a teenager and gaining illumination through them amazing Gosh, I love that. I love the fact that that was coming through you and that, you know, consciously you have no idea of it. And then obviously over time, it all makes so much more sense to you. And there really is, Michelle, a lost language of the womb and a lost linguistics and a lost etymology, which etymology means the study of word origins. And this was astounding to us when we started to really get this. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. And so the word har or hor, H-A-R-H-O-R, in the Semitic languages, which include Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, means womb. It also means cave. It also means fire. But these are, this is a womb word. And so the word hor originally was a holy word that, that meant womb. The word in Greek, heros, meant sacred. It was related to the goddess Hera. Both of these names, Hera and Heros, derived from the womb. So it was like the sacred womb, and Hera was the goddess of the womb, the creatrix. Mm. And it goes on from there. So the word harem, for example, it c- comes from the same womb origin. And and the ancient priestesses of of Babylon, it was the harem. And, it, you know, and it's, it's amazing. Gosh. And this is just one example of this language, language of the womb. And and everywhere you look in the ancient world, you find it. So the Oracle of Delphi, the Temple of Delphi, well, the word, and this is a famous, the most famous oracular temple in ancient Greece. Well, Delphi is the Greek word for womb. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, okay, gosh. And, and, it's, and it's really, and another example, in Japan, the word hara, H-A-R-A, originally meant womb and (laughs) and, you know it's and this is um it was later became a part of the martial arts and and kind of shinto um, practice in in the japanese tradition the hara was the center of gravity of an individual and if you move from your hara you're really working with your most um, powerful force so martial artists in japan and and uh, and the priest would would cultivate their hara power but it was originally womb power and gosh and, and so I, I love as Azra um you know kind of touched on the the high priestess of Ishtar was called the Harin and she ruled the city of Ishtar so we see this ancient lost tradition where women are powerful oracles rulers of cities spiritual initiators um, really uh, in the fullness of their power so we look at our world now and it's such a different world so I really feel that when Mary Magdalene was transmitting these symbols of this womb of light this enlightened or awakened womb to me as a teenager really what she was sharing as she's sharing with so many women is women it's time to wake up now to wake up your womb to become an oracle to become a leader to become a healer Mm. to become a portal of rebirth for yourself for the men in the world so we can start a different story in the world because of course you know our current paradigm our current culture is utterly bankrupt it's yeah. it's staggering it's on its last legs it's it's a very dangerous time but also a very important time as this as this um wisdom comes back uh to to remind women of who they really are and also as we were saying to to bring them back into their bodies the one place that they have been guided away from or have maybe received so much trauma and pain that it's the last place they really want to bring all their energy and awareness to so it takes a lot of courage and dedication uh to do this but once 
you understand it's not just personal, it's collective. And as I say, there, there's this council of these amazing uh, feminine divinities presiding over this rebirth, guiding us, um, that we, we must... We must take this journey back into our centre to reclaim our power. Yeah, and like you say, it's very much about embodiment, isn't it? So it's interesting how, you know, so many of us have had these peak meditation experiences where it's all about raising your energy up out of your body people talk about developing their intuition by opening their third eye and you know all of this kind of talk instead of actually going no you know bring your energy down into your body and feel what's stored in your body um so it's really kind of backwards, isn't it? That's how it, it's been. And now it's this process of bringing the energy back down, rooting ourselves fully into our physical body, which is the vehicle. Exactly. The, the body is, the, is the really the vehicle of ecstatic, you know, awakening and heaven on earth. And But first, it's like we have to kind of, clumber climb through some you know some sludge or dense memories to get to this jewel at the center of us and and I'd just like to share Michelle you know and how you know we we, we use these words like awakening but how practical it is and how it applies to your everyday you know for woman womanly experiences and I remember after, you know, these, this kind of huge symbolic initiation as a teenager, which obviously had reconfigured my psyche, but had not landed in my body yet. And when I was 20, around 21, I, I was a total hedonist. I loved ecstatic experiences of all the forbidden kinds. So... <laughs> So any way I could get high and get out of my body and touch this universal ecstatic experience, I was there. I was a total hedonist. And what kept calling me back was my body. And so what would happen is every time I would have these hedonistic kind of uh, experiences and, uh, and, you know, be in these very out of the body ecstatic, you know, states, very high, I would start to menstruate. Uh -huh. And it got to the point that I was literally menstruating every week. So it was like my womb was directly feeding back to me what she thought of my antics. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like this direct connection that she was speaking to me but because no one had given me the ability to translate her language it, it felt frustrating and frightening and upsetting you know why yeah. am I bleeding every week is there something wrong with me it's shameful and so I remember I was with a big group of friends and we were uh in Thailand on a beach uh, enjoying the full moon parties <laughs> and <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and this it happened again that I, I started to bleed you know out of rhythm with my cycle and of course on a beach where it's all about you know skimpy bikinis in the sea this was a, a nightmare that I, I kept bleeding and one day we, uh, my friends and I were staying on a very remote beach, uh, which was called Sunset Beach, and all the hedonism happened on another beach. And so every day everyone would kind of move to this beach. And this day I decided uh, that the voice of my womb was calling so strongly to me. And I'd, I, had, I wasn't consciously thinking, but I just had to answer this call. So as all my friends, uh, you know, kind of walked towards this, you know, party beach, 
I stayed on this remote beach and I just sat and it was full of rocks so you couldn't really go in the ocean and but the the waves were like pounding on the rocks and and I just sat there and I actually dropped my consciousness deep into my womb to ask her why are you bleeding in this way and that was really my first experience of this embodied womb consciousness or womb awakening because I found that as I descended my awareness into my womb I became one with all of nature Ah. and it was as if the sea was flowing through me and I had just merged with the energy field of Gaia and it was the most beautiful precious sensual experience it made getting high and ecstatic out of the body experiences look like child's play Mm. this feeling deep in my body deep in my womb and I was like this is it this is the grail this is this is what I'm seeking and after that experience I um you know, I stopped this kind of hedonism as I was, you know, experiencing it. And and really that was the turnaround in my journey from rather than trying to get out of my body to find ecstasy, trying to go deep within my body to, to touch this incredible ecstatic innocence at the heart of all life and of course in doing that I met the guardian at the gateway of the womb the shadow yeah the gift that keeps on giving (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) and so it's it's so interesting that you say that and you talk about you know that sort of irregular behavior from your menstrual cycle that was really kept drawing your attention repeatedly like back into your body and you know we seem to have increasing problems today don't we with people having issues with their fertility cycle um with their menstrual cycle and they often associate this part of the body with a lot of pain discomfort inconvenience trauma you know so if somebody's listening to this and they're like, oh, you know, I know that I've got so much stored here that I need to dive into, but they're worried that they're going to be completely overwhelmed. What advice would you give to somebody to start in a gentle way? Mm. So the first really um, thing that people need to take on board is to trust the womb. Yeah to trust the process. She is guiding you into healing and wholeness. And so it really requires that radical trust in the womb. After this experience of of, of going deeply into the womb and then meeting the shadow, you know, really an intense time unfolded Mm -hmm. after that. And, you know, eventually it culminated in in having endometriosis, which is the expression of the pain that was in my my body and my soul, my feminine soul. And and of course, we live in a world that denies symptoms. So we live in a world that defines health and well-being and happiness as having no symptoms. Yeah. So, you know, so if you are unhappy, take Prozac, you know, if you are ill, take a medicine to suppress the symptoms. So we've got this really back to front idea that health and uh, spirituality is the, the, the perfection that has no symptoms. It's actually on the deep feminine journey, the opposite. Mm. The more we come into ourselves the more we allow our soul and body to express. And this often talks to us through the medium of symptoms. So we don't see them as a a failure or a, a problem. It's actually an amazing divine communication from the intelligence of God, goddess, 
uh, guiding us. And so this is the this is the process. So any woman or man who takes this path will find this that they will begin to express symptoms. But these symptoms become the pathway to true healing, not repression of pain, not repression of feelings, but actually to experiencing them and integrating them and really um, opening to a new octave of beingness. And it's an example, I'll just say a quick example of this. So the body becomes the messenger. And and one of the things that's very common in women is what people call PMT or in the US PMS. So yeah. and this is the, the moodiness or, or um, different kinds of feelings, pain and bloating that can come around the time of menstruation. Yeah. And so a lot of people say, wow, this is really uncomfortable. A lot of women, and I just need to find a way to make these symptoms go away. And another way of, of approaching it is to say, well, what is the message my body is trying to communicate? What is the source of this pain and discomfort? And and by allowing the body to be a messenger and to really to open to, to see, well, what, what is it asking me to shift in my life? What is it asking me to open to? How can I take better care of myself? What would be needed? Then it begins this, this what starts as a symptom begins to open our soul and open our spiritual journey to a even greater and deeper healing. And perhaps it's saying, well, for those three or four days, maybe you need to organize your life to to rest more, to nourish yourself more, to allow yourself to dream and to journal and to create art. And when women do this, so many have found that their their symptoms begin to go away once they respond to the call and respond to the message. And so it's, it would be the same with endometriosis and so many other quote-unquote feminine problems. Well, the actual reason for these problems is because we live in a culture that doesn't honor the feminine experience and doesn't create the space. And once we began to create the space for ourselves and our life and associate with, with people who support us in this, then the symptoms begin to go away because we have answered the deeper call. Yeah, and it's about so much more than whether or not you've got a physical uterus or ovaries, isn't it as well? So for people that are listening who might have had a hysterectomy or some surgery, they can still, you know, very much tap into this energy and this portal within, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. The womb is a, a energetic space primarily, and I call it the soul of the womb. The soul of the womb remains in the woman, even if the physical womb is removed. And the soul of the womb is still holding all the gifts and also all the painful memories. So, um, it, it, you know, there's a sense sometimes that as women, especially when we're not as educated on the power of the womb, we kind of think, God, maybe if I just had it cut out, I wouldn't need to deal with these problems. And I know that's kind of how, you know, modern medicine positions it to a lot of women, that it's really like an act of convenience. So yeah. if you have PMT, if you have endometriosis, or fibroids. If, fibroids or cysts, and, uh, you know, just, well, let's just remove the womb and problem solve, you know, as if it's just a convenient thing. And so, of course, in some cases, there is a genuine medical need to remove the womb, which must be honored. Um, but in many cases, it's this desire to kind of sidestep, but the energy remains. So whether the physical womb is present or not, the gifts and the, the shadow is still there and needs to be journeyed with. And, a, you know, an example of that. So after this kind of huge shadow journey for me, and again, like I said, it was always the womb calling me home to my feminine soul. I couldn't avoid her. So then <laughs> she sh decided to shout louder and, you know, and, and I had endometriosis and fibroids. So just in case I wasn't listening. And, um, and I have very, very painful menstruation. 
And again, no one put it in any spiritual perspective for me. Uh, it was just kind of felt very inconvenient. You know, no one really understands uh, that you're in a lot of pain. And and so I, I took painkillers, heavy painkillers to try and stuff it back down. And, and then as I, you know, kind of deepened into my healing journey, through endometriosis and, and and went on a holistic healing and spiritual path, uh, I knew that I had to stop taking painkillers uh, as I got my menstruation. And again, to reframe it that these symptoms were angels, you know, and I had to welcome these angels and, and understand their message. And so the first menstruation that I had where I'd made the decision to not take any painkillers, I, uh, I was really afraid because I was afraid of the pain. And, and I, I, I lay down and I decided to meet this pain, to go on a journey with it. And what I discovered was that these, this pre premenstrual tension this pmt these pains that when i was kind of up and out in the world you know doing things i i couldn't really tune into but now you know in at this moment uh, in time as i did this lying on my bed focus completely on my womb and in these pain i started to notice that this pain was like contractions like almost like birthing pains it was it was contracting and releasing and contracting and some of the contractions were, were so painful they were like taking my breath away like I I might faint and so I just kept being with the pain and going deeper into it rather than running away and after about an hour of this so really an hour of agony oh, just riding the waves the a wave, a contraction and release came through me and it was orgasmic. Wow. I was like, I was like what's happening? <laughs> so, and so I just surrendered into it. And then, you know, for another hour, these incredible orgasmic waves were just pouring through me. It was exquisite. It was the most incredible uh, energy I'd ever felt, you know, even through my sexual experiences to that point and what I had perceived as an orgasm or orgasmic energy were, was nothing compared to the ecstasy and power and peacefulness and embodiment and just just so happy and blissful and and this happened through not suppressing the symptom not trying to make it go away but actually meeting it and understanding it as the voice of the womb the voice of the divine feminine calling to me Gosh, and that is an amazing metaphor for really allowing ourselves to go into those pains and uncomfortable feelings and emotions until we do get to the gifts that are hidden deeply often behind that, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's very analogous to to all feminine experiences to how how can we create a spaciousness to hold it and receive it and meet it and embrace it and so on that what are some of the other in you know surprising and interesting feedback um that you've received from people who are really working you know this with the womb awakening path and really trying to embody that and go into it very deeply. Have you, do you get a lot of interesting stories from around the world? We get so many interesting <laughs> and exciting stories, it really ranging from very practical to the most mystical. And, and this is the thing to understand it is that the path of, uh, of womb awakening is really an ancient mystery school path. It was a way of living and seeing and perceiving the world that was that very much wrapped up in all of the sacred and mundane parts of life. And so 
So when we begin to open and clear the womb, or in men, there's an equivalent space, the hara, and you know this is the same the same idea. But when we begin to open and clear this, we birth all kinds of beautiful things into our life that can be very practical or or can be very spiritual, because the womb is the birthing portal, and so what we've seen when women and men start to begin to heal and and be in touch with this womb energy they can have physical healing so we've and they and, and pregnancies and that we've there have been so many women and men who have had difficulty conceiving and then they begin to to make contact with and connect and open the womb portals and then all of a sudden they're pregnant in a month i mean we've had this happen multiple <laughs> times and we've had multiple people who have had difficult time in relationship and and it's been a life story, really, you know, with a lot of drama. And then they began to open into these new fields, these codes of, of creation and love that are stored within the womb. There's a, it's a holographic imprint stored within the womb. And when we connect to it, new doorways open, new relationships begin, yeah. and, and new, new projects, new, new directions in, in the creative world and in vocation. There's Really, there have been so many people who open into a new sacred vocation or a soulful vocation, whether it be art or or music or healing or um, environmental kinds of work. There's it opens the doorways, it opens the the portal for new creations, and it's really the the, the womb is the master, the mistress, really of our law of attraction of what we magnetize yeah. into our life. So when we clear and open the womb portal, we bring new things into our life, and and you know this is the beginning. <laughs> we could go on yeah. and on. And it's so, I was just thinking on a very practical level, I know myself, since I've been focusing on this, I had cysts on, you know, both of my ovaries. And then when I went back to have it checked again a few months later, they'd all cleared up and they've gone, mm. you know. So, of course, I was over the moon about that because I thought, I don't really want to have surgery unless it's essential, um, and, you know, they wanted to keep a, a regular check on it. So when I went back and they said, look, it's all clear from the results, I just thought, see, it works. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. You, you should, we should prescribe womb awakening to the doctors. Yeah. But, you know, and I, I wanted to say, you know, one of the most amazing concepts that I find in in womb awakening is, these two aspects, core aspects of feminine experience, female experience, ovulation and menstruation, you know, mm. in, in uh, adulthood, if the womb is still there, um, we think of them as just physical. So it's like, so we think men don't ovulate or menstruate, or maybe women in the menopause don't ovulate and menstruate. But this is not true at all, is that there is obviously a physical ovulation and a physical menstruation, but really these are flows of energy and, and an ovulation is a, a, a energy of creation and conceiving of what you want to be and what you want to birth in the world. It's like a way of getting pregnant with inspiration yes. or getting pregnant with ideas or you know getting pregnant with love so uh and then menstruation is an energetic process so men menstruate too uh, menstruation is a release and a letting go and a renewal and it's so important that we we get back in touch with not just the physical, practical, you know, bodily functions, but the energetic, spiritual signatures that both men and women have. And to know there is a time to conceive and a time to dissolve and to start to work with this wisdom, uh, which helps us manifest and live our lives. So for me, this is one of the, the really the most beautiful things of working in a womb circle and working with lots of people worldwide is 
to see people get back in touch with these creative rhythms and and ride the waves of times in their life when they're dissolving and releasing and letting go and trusting that and then times in their life where they're conceiving and creating and um, and being fertilized by the manner of life and and learning to trust these rhythms because in the modern linear world were taught to uh, be afraid of resting or releasing or yeah. dissolving and so for a lot 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 of people it's like that's frightening and as soon as things are happening in their life that feel like they're letting go or losing things they they get terrified rather than understanding oh this is a a a, a, a a wave to ride and expand into and it's actually going to lead to a new creative spurt so I love to watch that and the the brilliant thing about you know journeying in a group as as we all do is to see that in other people sometimes it's hard to see it in yourself yeah but in other people, you you see it so clearly when someone's in a full moon phase of their life or someone's in a dark moon phase of their life. And, and I, I feel that by witnessing other people, uh, it helps us to trust this journey and, and listening to everyone's stories. Uh, one of the things that always amazes me is how many people say to us that, they came to this work through a dream or <laughs> through just uh, be you know just having an intuition to type womb awakening or womb into into the computer so and then you know as we gather in this circle there's so many reflections and you start to really understand that this is not just a personal healing journey though it is that it's like this wider movement that's happening that's not coming from Azra and I you know it's like many people in the world are all receiving this this energy that's propelling us all into this this path of of reclaiming uh really the power of life and the understanding about how we can live in harmony with our own bodies with our own rhythms with each other in relationship in you know sisterhood and one other thing, Michelle, is that I'll add that one of the things that's been most exciting really for for me to watch is, as Sarah mentioned, we we travel in this with a group of people and, and we call it a womb circle. So it's all over the world. People are are doing this and we are sharing and communicating. And one of the things that comes forth is a lot of psychic and and really oracular, what I would call oracular awakening and so people mm. receive messages and dreams and sometimes it's for their own life sometimes it's for someone else in the circle or sometimes uncovering secret history of of the world or um you know all of these different really super sensory capacities what we would consider as telepathic or yeah. clairvoyant and these are all innate capacities that live within us and as we begin to open the doorways to what we call womb consciousness and and these these deep pathways in our psyche and in our, our body, then then all of these these really mystical experiences and, and psychic experiences begin to open up as well, and and that's that's really exciting. Really it is, and it's. I was just thinking as you were talking then about how you know, like you were talking about different cycles and different, you know, phases that people are at in their lives. And one of the things that we struggle with in our sort of model is the ability to rest and pause without feeling guilty and feeling that we need to be busy and doing all the time. So that can almost be like an unlearning as well, isn't it? Surrendering into this path of knowing that there are different times, different seasons, different phases. And sometimes it is time to just rest and receive and be in more of one of those yin phases. Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. And and I really feel like this is one of the biggest obstacles for mm. definitely men, but also women, that women 
actually a very wired and programmed to masculine solar ways of being always being productive always being busy always doing always looking after other people always feeling like they have to perfect themselves in some way whether that's going to the gym or or taking uh, you know a new study course and this kind of relentless pressure to do more and be more where all the feminine gifts lie in this magical moonlit world yeah. of rest and pleasure and celebration and it's actually a very wanton uh realm and of course in our current culture this is really disapproved of you know it's like lazy self-indulgent you know all these kind of words that we've often internalized so as we start to descend down into the feminine dimension and rest and play and enjoy and you know experience pleasure and do things that don't have a productive value you know so we might write in our journal or just craft just because we want to this voice starts to kick in you ought to be doing something lazy self-indulgent and and then this kind of guilt comes up and we then propel ourselves back out into the busyness and the busyness is actually a deliberate strategy by a patriarchal energy to disconnect us from our souls our body and our power Mm, so true and so amazing that yeah collectively we're really learning to tap into this wisdom much more and yeah so it's just it just seems like the perfect time for your book um to be birthed now after all this years of work and your own experiences being integrated and embodying all of that so very exciting times yeah yeah it's so exciting we're really really excited to see it birth into the world and also what other people will do with it you know the threads how the threads will weave out into the world and so what's your deepest wish in bringing this out into the physical now well the the book was was born from a vision and it was a vision of love it was a vision of interconnection with the earth it was a a vision of of honoring really the connection with all of life and the universe and the cosmos and to create a a world that's more in in tune with this. And so we dedicated the book to Mother Earth, to Gaia, because she's a living, sentient being, really a super organism. And and, and so our our wish really, our, our, our wish is that this book really touch people's souls and and help them awaken to themselves and and to the sacred feminine and in doing so to create an amazing and, and beautiful world for our children and our children's children and and to really to really begin this this shift in consciousness that the world so needs. And it's interesting, Michelle, you know, just to add a note to that, we wrote the book in lunar consciousness. So it's a big book and it's like a, a paradox and a riddle. And <laughs> most books are written in solar consciousness. Even books about the feminine are written in solar consciousness. So as we were writing and birthing this book in lunar consciousness, it was you know, amazing to feel how revolutionary that felt to express something through the mystery and through the lunar eye. And every so often we will both be like, gosh, surely, shall we just, shouldn't we just be doing this in like solar consciousness? You know, here's the bullet point. Here's the, the here's the, the simplified, you know, you know, kind of crib sheet, the revision notes that you can, we've just totally summed it up very clearly and logically, and you can totally get it. And every time we felt like that, you know, we would open and the message from Divine Mother would be, no, 
this is a book that's destined to carry the frequency of lunar consciousness. So what this does as you read the book, it does not give you a, a prescriptive list of explanations and bullet points and it doesn't facilitate your logical mind to go away and feel satisfied like it totally understands the womb mysteries. <laughs> it actually melts your logical mind takes you through the magic doorway into a world of infinite possibilities and questions. And really, we we want to guide people into that lunar realm of magic so they can play and explore and receive uh, for themselves. Oh, fantastic. I can't wait to read it. And um, yeah, I'm sure you're going to get so many amazing messages and some really interesting feedback about what's been sparked for people as they've been reading that and their crazy dreams and stuff during it as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's an initiation. Reading the book is an initiation in itself. Oh, well, I wish you so much luck. Not that it's going to need it because it's all just unfolding perfectly. But yeah, so excited. And thank you so much for sharing all of your experience and wisdom about it today. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a, a real pleasure to be here. And I'll also say, it's this is the, the Womb Awakening book, at Womb Awakening: Initiatory Wisdom from the Creatrix of All Life. Uh, it is a it is a <laughs> really the beginning of what is a vast process. And mm-hmm. for for those who wish to learn more and wish to dive deeper, you can visit our website, thefountainoflife.org, and we have courses and classes and other books and music and there's a whole world for people <laughs> that really who, is <laughs> who really and, and yeah. groups of circles all you know around the world and events and retreats so there's really a whole world waiting for people who really feel the call and want to dive in and explore more yes absolutely and um, so thank you so much and i'll include the links and in that in the post as well for people Wonderful. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, you so been a real pleasure. much, Michelle. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to Unclassified Woman. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. For information on events and services, connect with Michelle at michellemariemcgrath.com.